Well, I can tell you all are very excited about him, but I find a certain irony here. A uh, show of hands, those of you who kind of hope that Administrator Pruitt will just sort of make the EPA go away. <laughs> How does it feel to be here today with pretty much everyone hoping that the very agency you are running is going to go away, literally? Well, it's justified. I think as we look over the last several years, uh, the agency that I'm tasked to lead at this point has been used by the previous administration to truly impact our country in ways that we never could have imagined eight years ago. Uh, jobs have been impacted. The authority uh, that the Washington, D.C. has, the assumption of power and the accumulation of power, uh, they've taken advantage of that. And so I think it's justified. I think people across this country look at the EPA much like they look at the IRS. Uh, and I hope, to, I hope to be able to change that and, uh, and, and change that consistent with the principles we just talked about, Dr. Gina. Yeah. Well, I have a few little things that you may or may not know about, but this is, uh, you've got your hands full. Let me just say that. Uh, the EPA, I do know that. <laughs> <laughs> the EPA grants $4 billion a year. A couple of examples of that, $84,000 to the University of Michigan to study, you're going to love this, the effectiveness of using churches to promote environmentalist causes. Money to the University of California, Riverside received a grant to study carbon emissions from evil barbecue grills. $1.5 million went to the University of Colorado to study pollution caused by residential cooking in Africa. That's important use of your tax dollars. <laughs> and uh, Cal last but not least, a Unitarian church received um, an environmental justice Grant. So you're a baseball guy. I right? am. I am. And so I've had to study up on some of my baseball statistics for this interview just for okay. you. Okay, that's good to hear. My son's a big baseball fan, but I'm going to be honest That's also good here. to hear. Yeah. Yes. So uh, you had a guy from Oklahoma, Mickey Mantle. That's right. Yeah. You're probably a big fan of him, right? Well, um, when he retired, he was third on the home run list with 583 of those. But Pete Rose, I understand, is your favorite baseball player. Someone He's one of them. That. Yes, yes. Uh, all time hit record all-time hit record uh, holder. So here's my question. When it comes to cutting all of the regulation, are you going to be more like Pete Rose <laughs> with lots of hits and undo it a little bit at a time? Or are you just going to go for those home runs like Mickey Mantle? What's it going to be? It's good, it's good to do both, right? It's good, it's good to hit a few out of the park, and it's also good to move the ball down the field in football as well. But, but I, I, think it's, I, I think it is both. I think there are some uh, regulations that in the near term, need to be rolled back in a very aggressive way. And uh, I think maybe next week, you may be hearing about some of those uh, as it relates to some of these key issues. And we know what those are. Uh, we know that uh, the, the, the previous administration uh, took the Waters of the United States rule and transformed the Clean Water Act and made puddles and dry creek beds across this country subject to the jurisdiction of Washington, D.C. That's going to change. The future ain't what it used to be there. And so uh, I, do think, I, I do think, Dr. Gina, there's going to be some big uh, uh, steps taken to address some of those regulations, and then, and then there'll be several uh, singles and doubles as well. You, you walked in that first day with a lot of people who wonder if they're going to have a jo uh, jobs. I posted on social media, what did people want me to ask you? The number one thing is, how much can we cut from the EPA budget? People are suggesting we take it down 90% on social media. You know, that's something, it's something that's very difficult to know at this point. I'm, I've only been there since Tuesday. Uh, so, oh, come on. so So it's something, we've, it's something we've got to figure out as far as how we're going to do business in the future. I think in the near term, the most important thing that we can focus upon at the EPA is getting the law right. Making sure that the regulations that are, that are uh, posted and adopted by that agency are consistent with the rule of law and consistent with congressional mandate. And then roll back those that are, are inconsistent uh, from the previous administration. So I think that's the work in the near term. Mm -hmm. I, I think long term, asking the question on how that agency partners with the states and how that affects the budget, how it affects the structure, is something we'll work on very diligently. The issue of climate change on the other side is that you guys can clap for that answer, yes. <laughs> I can't for the life of me see where my time is. If someone could just point it to me. I don't want to go over. Somebody wave big at me when I need to shut up. Um, I, I, I want to ask you this because uh, 
what the issue, issue of climate change is brought up over and over again. You've been grilled on this mercilessly. Um, but uh, That's quite I, a process, by the way, that center confirmation process is quite a yeah, process. You, well, I don't recommend yeah. it to anyone. I've been, I've been trying to if you know, forget that process <laughs> you know, for the last uh, two or three weeks. But anyway. Yeah. Well, uh, one thing you said, I love this quote. Uh, you said, um, if it is possible to minimize the uh, rises of, cl of climate change, then is also the same exaggeration should go for, um, you know, if, if, if people are under, are overestimating the problems of climate change. Um, but you also said this, the climate is changing and human activity, con activity contributes to that in some manner. What is that manner? Well, we don't, we don't know, and that's the difficulty with this issue, because we, to measure with precision that impact is something that is very difficult to do. But let's not forget something are the tools in the toolbox. Even, I think the last several years, the focus has been on whether the climate is changing, whether humans are contributing to it, uh, and, and the scientific review of that. But there's a whole other part of the question, uh, the, the equation that's not being asked. If it is happening, what can Congress and what can the administrative state do about it? If the tools aren't in the toolbox, if Congress hasn't spoken on the issue, agencies just can't make it up. They can't just say, we're, we're just gonna go forward irrespective of whether Congress has spoken. Remember. Administrative agencies like EPA, they're in the executive branch. They exist to enforce the law, as passed by whom? Congress, the legislative branch. And so if Congress has not spoken, the executive branch just can't go forward. And so I think the, the debate here is about process. It's about rule of law. It's about making sure that agencies across the federal government are empowered to do the things that they're seeking to do historically. Mm -hmm. And so, so, yes, go ahead and clap. Sorry. <laughs> they always want to cheer for you. This is great. So, so top priorities as you're, as you're really looking at, like what you just love to tackle first, you know, uh, President Trump has his 100 day plan. That's right. What's yours? Regulatory certainty. I mean, when you look at uh, tax and fiscal policy in this country, very, very important to our economic growth, no doubt. But if you ask most business owners over the last several years what has been the greatest impediment to their ability to grow their business, whether it's the finance sector, healthcare, energy, it's what? Regulatory uncertainty. It's agencies making it up as they go. It, it's agencies acting in a way that says, the statute says one thing, but we're gonna do exactly the opposite. That cannot continue. We have to send a message across the country. We have to send a message across the country that we're going to provide certainty by living within the framework that Congress has passed. And so we're gonna see regulations roll back that don't are consistent with that, Dr. Gina. WOTUS, Clean Power Plan, the methane rule, there are several. We've got plenty to say grace over. Yeah, exactly, I love that. So um, you described a little bit about what it was like to walk in that first day and have people, you know, whatever. You, you were controversial. I mean, you, I said to you, was this, I? Is a, this, is a, <laughs> this is a homecoming here at CPAC. He's been here forever, and uh, we all love him here, but that same love is flipped exactly on its head in certain other audiences, right? So tell, me, tell them a little bit about what you shared with me about your optimism, really, of the people that you have to work with. Well, one of the things that I, I really wanted to try to establish day one uh, is, is share a little bit about who I am as a person and how I lead. And, and I really believe that as a leader, wh whether, you're, whether you're leading the EPA or a business, you've got to listen and learn, and then you've got to make decisions. And so I wanted to send a message to those in the agency. There's some very important things that, that the EPA does for this country. Uh, there are air quality issues and water quality issues that cross state line. We have over 1,300 Superfund sites across the country. Those are sites that have been put on a national priority list like the one in, uh, in Portland, Oregon, that literally have been, uh, the communities there have had water issues or, or with respect to the Hanover nuclear facility for three or more decades. It hasn't been cleaned up. The EPA hasn't cleaned it up. And so there's some very important work to protect and provide leadership in the environmental space. But what's happened on the last several years is the previous administration was so focused on climate change and so focused on CO2 that th some of those other priorities were left behind. Oh. How to clean up those communities. How to, how to, we as Republicans no, don't have anything to be apologetic about with respect to the environment. Mm -hmm. Nothing. We have always believed that you can grow jobs, grow an economy, while also doing what? Being a good steward of the environment. That's what we're tasked to do, and yeah. we can do both. So. One of the most uh, interesting facts that maybe many of you know is that when he was Attorney General in Oklahoma, you sued the EPA 14 times. Deservedly. <laughs> I believe it. <laughs> but have you had a lot of questions about that from the people that you're working with now? We, we, I have, and it came up in the Senate confirmation hearing uh, 
a few times. <laughs> but, 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 as, but as it came up, you know, ask yourself this, why, why would the state of Oklahoma, the state of Texas, the state of West Virginia, or any other state in the country sue the EPA? Well, it's one, because the EPA was acting inconsistent with the statute. They said, you know what, the states have authority, but we're going to disregard that. We're going to displace that. We're going to duplicate that and force ourselves upon the states. Do you know, I'm sure you do, because this is something you studied this morning, but let me tell you a, st a, st a stat. President Bush won, President Clinton, and President Bush II, three administrations, issued something called a Federal Implement Implementation Plan, a FIP, a federal plan, forced upon the states five times in three administrations. This last administration, President Obama, did it 56 times in eight years. What does that say to you? It says this, that the previous administration saw the states as a mere vessel of federal will, did not respect the Ninth and Tenth Amendment, did not respect Congress, did not respect the statute, did not respect rule of law. So when you do that, what happens? You get sued. And we not only sued, we won. We stopped the Clean Power Plan. We stopped, we stopped WOTUS. And guess what that means? Guess what that means now? This president, who is leading with great decisiveness, who is expressing great action, is saying, we're going to fix that, and I'm so thankful. I'm so thankful that I've got that kind of leader in the White House so we can go to the EPA to get all those things fixed now. And we should celebrate that. So exciting. Yeah. Really so exciting. Um, when all is said and done, and uh, this, this journey has come to an end for you in terms of this job, um, what do you want it to look like? What do, what do you want that legacy to be? I mean, everything is, you, you, there are a lot of factors that will play into that, and I understand that some of that may be fluid. But right now, when you visualize what your accomplishment will look like, what do you want them to have said about you? I, I really want this previous panel that you just, just heard, as far as the younger generation, the millennials, uh, they have bought, a, they bought an, an argument and a narrative that says that we cannot be pro-energy and pro-environment. And we can. We can as a nation, we always have been. And I think, I think that, that when, we, when we have a mutually exclusive kind of approach, that if you're pro-environment, you're anti-energy, and if you're pro-energy, you're anti-environment, what that means is that we've put on jerseys, you know, that we've, we've, we've been used to serve political ends. We as a nation are better than that. We do it better than anybody in the world as far as growing an economy and being a good steward of the environment. So I hope, whenever the day comes that I, that I leave the EPA, I hope that the people in this country recognize that we've accomplished that, that we're better than China, that we're better than India, that we're better than developing nations across the globe because we do both. We grow jobs, we see jobs in West Virginia and Ohio and Pennsylvania, and we also take care of our water, and we also take care of our air, and we take care of the future for our children. That's what I believe needs to happen. You know, you make such a great point. You make such a great point that a lot of this is Honestly, this is messaging. Like your greatest battle is really of a marketing nature, in some ways, because getting popular opinion to go along to match up with the policy and the regulation uh, that you want to change—that's messaging. So, how can the people here at CPAC help you take that message to their peers, their work environment, their schools as they go back out in the real world after the safe space of CPAC? I don't well, know. <laughs> Well, I think that one of, one, another key term and a key word for me is trust. You know, we, there, there's distrust right now that exists between the states and Washington, D.C. as it relates to the, the EPA and the environment. We need to do what we can to restore trust. And so we're actually going to dedicate resources, Gina, to go out across the country. I'm going to be spending time in West Virginia and Ohio and states with governors and their respective executive departments there. And I'm going to send a message. Let's join arm in arm to do what's important for the environment. Let's restore trust and let's recognize and understand that you in those states believe in clean air and clean water. And, and I really believe at the end of eight years, we're gonna have better air quality, we're gonna have better water quality because it will be vested in what? A partnership, a partnership that exists constitutionally and exists legally and I hope in messaging as well. And all that's very measurable. Yes, very measurable. And that's the exciting part. It is. So we have a lot to look forward to with you. The future ain't what it used to be. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> Congratulations. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very you much. So Thank much. you so much. Thank, Thank you, guys. You.